Hello, hello. Welcome to chapter 19, the circulatory system, the heart. This is going to be part three. All right, everyone. So thus far, as we've perused through parts one and part two of the chapter, we have discussed the anatomy of the heart, blood flow through the heart. We've taken a look at the arteries and veins that supply the heart. And then we've also taken a look at the conduction system, i.e. the electrical currents running through the hearts, and how we can use an EKG to kind of explain the electrical charges and correlate that then with the systolic and diastolic motion of the heart itself. In this particular part, we're going to review some of these concepts that we've encountered before, and we're also going to add a little bit more detail when it comes to the actual amount of blood that will flow through each of the chambers, and how we can correlate that, for instance, with the heart sounds, as well as with the contraction forces that we see with the systolic and the diastolic motion. So let's just do a quick reminder, and I'm looking at my slide right over here. It says a cardiac cycle basically means that you have a complete contraction, which is going to be the systolic motion, and a complete relaxation, the diastolic motion, of all four chambers of the heart. So those are going to be your two atriums and your two ventricles on top. And as we were discussing part one, some of you might remember that there was a question posed that said, how does pressure actually affect the blood flow and how are the heart sounds produced? And these two are actually related to each other. And we talked about the fact that when you look at the heart valve in the heart, the AV valve, so your atrioventricular valve and the semilunar valve, that they will only open up depending on the pressure changes that they are exposed to. And this goes with an underlying concept that flow is proportionate to the change of pressure. It is easier for a liquid to flow from a high pressure point to a low pressure point. Let's go ahead and switch over to the illustration and let's see if we can add a little bit more detail to some of the statements that I just made. Alrighty, so here are four illustrations, and the two on top concentrate on the atrioventricular valve, the two on the bottom on the semilunar valve. And if the illustration looks familiar to you, it's because you've seen it before when we discussed the opening and the closing of the valve in part one. Now, on top, it basically reminds you that in order for your AV valve to open up, the pressure in your atrium needs to exceed the pressure of the ventricle. Since the blood will flow from a high to a low pressure point, what we see happening is as soon as the ventricle is relaxed enough that the pressure has dropped and the atrium is filled up with enough blood that the pressure is high, the valves will open up and blood will flow from the atrium into the ventricle. As blood is flowing into the ventricle, it's not only filling up the chamber, it's also building up its pressure point. And eventually we're going to get to the point where the ventricle is so filled with blood that it has a higher pressure point than the atrium does. And what does blood want to do in that case? Well, it would want to reverse its course. It would want to keep going from high to low, but that would mean that it would have to flow from the ventricle to the atrium. And that is then where your AV valves are going to shut down and they're going to close. Because remember, the purpose of a valve is to prevent backwards flow. We always want to keep the blood flowing in a one-way direction. So from the atrium to the ventricle to the outside of the heart, never backwards. So you're going to notice on the top part, um, it says the AV valve will open and the green arrow will allow blood to flow from the atrium to the ventricle. That's only if the pressure in the atrium is higher than that in the ventricle. The minute the ventricle pressure becomes too high or higher than the atrium, then we see that the picture will now state the atrioventricular valves will close off and that will prevent the blood from backflowing because the valves have closed off and they will not allow the blood to go back into the original spot of the atrium. The same concept can be applied when we take a look at our semi-lunar valves. Now what we're doing is we're taking a look at the movement between the ventricle and the outside of the heart. It could be either um, if we're looking on the right side from the right ventricle into the pulmonary trunk and the pulmonary arteries. If we're looking on the left hand side, we're talking about the left ventricle and the aortic arch. So either way, in order for your semilunar valves to open up, 
we're going to need to have a higher pressure point in the ventricle than we have in those blood vessels. So the semilunar valves will open up, blood will go gushing out of the heart, and as the ventricle starts to get empty, the pressure drops, and at a certain point, the pressure is higher in the pulmonary arteries and in the aorta than it is in the ventricles. So blood would have a tendency to flow backwards. And that is then the part where we see that our semilunar valves will close off once again to prevent backflow from occurring. Now, please excuse my redundancy. I know I've said it a bunch of times, but I just want to make sure that we understand that the purpose of the valve is to ensure one-way flow or you could say to prevent backflow. And the valve will only open if the liquid can flow from a high pressure point to a low pressure point. And as the valve is opening and closing its actual mechanics, it does seamlessly, and it also does it without any sound. When you will hear a sound is the part when the valve closes and the blood hits the back of the valve, it will make a thunk sound, and that is then correlated as the lub and dub sound that we associate with our heartbeat. So here on our slide it says, oscillation is when we listen to sounds that the body makes, and when you listen to heart sounds, it's often described as a lub-dub sound. And the lub sound, that's called your S1, it's your first heart sound you hear, that's going to be correlated with the turbulence of the blood hitting the back of the closed AV blood valve. Your second heart sound, S2, your dub, this one tends to be a little bit sharper. This one will correlate with the blood hitting the back of the semilunar valve as they close which actually makes sense because if you review your blood flow through the heart, we know that blood will enter into the atrium, go through the AV valve, enter the ventricle, go through the semilunar valves, and out the heart it goes again. So the first valve to actually close in this pathway is going to be your AV valve, that's S1, and then your second valve to close off, that will then be your semilunar valve, that is S2. Please take note that on your PowerPoint for both the first and the second heart sound, I did write towards the end, I said the actual valves do not make a sound because the actual act of opening and closing the valves is done without any sound. What you're hearing is the blood hitting the back of the valves after they have closed. Now, some books will also mention the fact that there is a third sound. They like to call it a, a lub dub dub sound, so they'll double up on that dub for the S3. This third sound is usually only heard in um, children, as well as some elderly citizens will have it. It's associated with the fact that the heart will rapidly fill with content, and the expanding of the ventricle will make that third sound that sometimes you'll hear when you're listening. But very stereotypically, you'll just hear a lub and a dub when you listen. And I apologize, I tried to sync some audio in here so that as I was kind of chit-chatting with you, you could hear the lub-dub sound, but I wasn't able to do that. So whenever you get a chance, go ahead and just YouTube or within your Learn Smart module, you'll be able to listen to the heart as it's beating in case you want to get a more animated version of the lub-dub than the one that I can provide you. I really like this slide. This slide takes a look at the cardiac cycle and it's going to remind us of some of the things we've already talked about. You know, we talked about the fact that the blood flow will start in the atrium and move its way to the ventricle and then to the outside of the heart. And it also talks about the fact that the pressure starts to change. And because of the pressure changes, we can now explain the valve's opening and closing. So I want to show you something. So go ahead and take a look on the left-hand side where the text is written out. And it says, if you're going to have the phases of the cardiac cycle, we always like to kind of start off with seeing what the ventricle is doing. Because usually at the start of a heart cycle, we know that the ventricle is in its diastolic motion, so it's completely relaxed. And as it's relaxed, the AV valves tend to be open, so blood can go ahead and flow from the atrium into the ventricle. And the reason the AV valves are open is because when the ventricle is relaxed, it tends to have a very low pressure point, much lower than the atrium. So once again, the valves will open up so blood can flow from a high pressure point, the atrium, into the low pressure point of the ventricle.
So your first thing it says, you'll have ventricle filling during diastolic motion of the ventricle. And go ahead and take a look at the illustration that is on the right-hand side. And you're going to see it's labeled ventricular filling. So you have it filling because blood is flowing from the atrium into the ventricle. And we know that the pacemaker cells are located in the atrium. They do not have a stable resting membrane potential, which means that they are consistently getting excited. And we have a heartbeat every 0.8 seconds, which means that before you know it, the atrium will be at the point where it's excited. It is doing its systolic motion. It's contracting. And as it's contracting, it basically forces more blood into the ventricle. Now, as the atrium is in its systolic motion, the ventricle is still in its diastolic motion, but it's getting towards the end part of the diastolic motion because as the ventricle is getting exposed to the electrical currents that are running through the conduction system, it's getting excited. So what we're going to see happening is as the ventricle gets towards the end of this diastolic motion, it's going to switch over to its systolic motion, meaning it's going to start contracting. There will come a time, though, where you will switch from ventricular filling to isovolumetric contraction. Isovolumetric contraction, and this is in the yellow box illustrated, refers to the fact that there will come a time where there is enough blood in the ventricle that it has a high pressure point, higher than the one you find in the atrium. So that means that your AV valves will close off. Notice the little black arrow, the blood can't flow back into the atrium. However, since this is the beginning of the systolic contraction of the ventricle, we see that the pressure point might be higher than it is in the atrium, but it is not higher than what you find in those blood vessels, so the pulmonary trunk and the aorta. And for that reason, your semilunar valves are still closed i.e. the blood can't go anywhere. So in isofollometric contraction, iso means the same, means that the same volume of blood is staying in the ventricle during the initial stages of systolic motion because the pressure is not high enough for the semilunar valves to open. Now, eventually, the pressure will keep building as the ventricle proceeds through its systolic motion, and there will come a time where the pressure in the ventricle is higher than that of the blood vessels, so it will go ahead and cause ventricular ejection. So go ahead and take a look at picture three, and you can see that the pressure has exceeded that of the pulmonary arteries and the aorta. So the semilunar valves are opening up and the blood is gushing out of the heart. Now, what comes after a systole or systolic motion? Well, we go back to our relaxation, our diastolic motion. So the ventricle will repolarize and it will start to relax. And what we see happening is before it can fully relax, it's going to encounter an isofollometric relaxation point. And the isofollometric, once again, means the volume of blood is going to stay the same. And it does so because both your semilunar valves and your AV valves are going to be closed. So the blood cannot enter the ventricles during the first initial stages of diastole or relaxation because the pressure point is simply not there for your AV valves to open up just yet and receive initial blood from the atrium. Of course, we know that overall this takes about 0.8 seconds to have a complete cardiac cycle. And we've discussed this before in part two when we did our EKG analysis. We talked about the fact that the EKG is able to see the electrical currents or the action potentials as it's flowing through the atriums and the ventricle. And we discussed the fact that the P wave is going to correlate with the atrium getting excited and doing its systolic motion. That usually lasts about 0.1 seconds. Then the ventricular, as it's getting excited and it's going to start contracting, we see that one will take a little bit longer. Part of that has to do with the fact that the ventricle is larger. And obviously the T wave will then correlate with the ventricular repolarization and diastolic motion, its relaxation. Now, then you have this 
line, this linear time, which is indicated by the little red arrow on my EKG image, that line of no excitement, that is called the quiescent period. It is when all four chambers are in diastolic motion, and it lasts about 0.4 seconds. It's an excellent time for the heart to kind of reset itself and wait for the pacemakers to fire off their next shot and therefore initiate the whole P, Q, R, S, and T complexes. The entire cardiac cycle, if we all add it up with the 0.1 second for the atrium, the 0.3 for the ventricle, and the 0.4 for the quiescent period will take about 0.8 seconds. So that means that in a 60 second period, the heart on average will beat 75 times per minute. All right, now here is another illustration that is of interest. This one takes all the knowledge that we've discussed in our previous parts, and it kind of combines it all. So what I'm going to recommend you do is when you get to sit down and you start studying for your exam for Chapter 19, uh, when you get towards the end part and you feel confident about the material, come back to this graph and kind of walk your way through it. Try to explain what's happening. So you want to be able to explain things like, for instance, on the top part, it explains how the pressure points, how they'll start to increase and decrease, and how that correlates with the systolic and diastolic motion of the heart. We can also take a look at the third part where you have your EKG, and you want to be able to describe what's happening in the P wave, the QRS wave, uh, reflection, excuse me, or the T wave. You also see the heart sounds. There's your S1 and your S2 correlating with the fact that your AV valve is closing, S1, and S2 with the correlation of the closing of the semilunar valve. And then all the way in the bottom, you once again see your full cardiac cycle, and you can also see the mention of the isofollometric contraction and isofollometric relaxation. Now, one thing that we really haven't discussed all that much is that second row item on this graph, which is to take a look at some of the volumes of blood as they're flowing through the ventricle. And for that, we're going to come across terms like end diastolic volume and end systolic volume. So let's go ahead and try to explain those terms, and let's see how we can explain how one will cause the volume to go up in the ventricle and the other one will cause the volume to go down. All right, so um, just so we're all clear, remember when you see systolic or systole, that means that you are contracting. When you see diastolic or diastole, that means that you are relaxing. Now, hopefully everyone will agree with me that if you're doing a systolic motion and you're contracting, that means that you're squeezing the chambers as they're contracting, which will correlate with the chamber giving off or removing the blood. So the blood is going to exit the chamber when it's contracting. On the other hand, if the chamber is in its diastolic or relaxation phase, it's just kind of sitting there, open, low pressure point, which means it's excellent for it to be receiving the blood. And whatever happens on the right side is happening on the left side and vice versa. So for instance, when you take a look at this graph right here, it's going to talk about how much blood do I normally find in the ventricle. And notice how they don't have to say the right ventricle or the left ventricle because we need to have a balance. Everything needs to be the same volume-wise. So on top it says, in the ventricle, you on average have an end systolic volume of 60 mLs. So that means systolic needs to contract. So at the end of contraction, there's about 60 mLs of blood that's left in the ventricle. The ventricle will never be completely empty because it needs a pressure point. So we'll never empty out the ventricle completely. So that means that your end systolic volume is how much blood remains inside the ventricle chamber after you have contracted, after you've done your systolic motion. So in our example, we see we have 60 mLs of blood. After the ventricle is done contracting, it will start to relax. It's going to initiate its diastolic motion. And obviously, at that point, what we see happening is once it passes the isofollometric relaxation phase, we see that the AV valves will open up and we see that blood will flow from the atrium into the ventricle. 
So on my chart, what I'm seeing is that it says passively added to the ventricle during atrium diastole is going to be 30 ml. So this is just by the valves opening up what will trickle into the ventricle. And then obviously when the atrium will contract, the atrium will full on do its systolic motion, it will squeeze the top chamber and it will allow additional blood to flow into the ventricle. So the ventricle will get another 40 mLs of blood as it's just sitting there. So we started with 60 and then from the atrium we had a total of 70 mL, 30 plus 40, that was added. So at the end of the diastolic motion, at the end of the ventricle getting towards this relaxation phase, the ventricle will have 60 ml plus 70 ml is 130 ml. So the end diastolic volume is how much blood was the ventricle able to hold on to when it was relaxing and receiving blood from the top chamber, the atrium. Now, at the end of its diastolic motion, obviously the ventricle will go back into systolic motion. It's time to contract. So what we see happening is when the ventricle contracts, it's going to release blood either into the pulmonary arteries or into the aorta, depending on what side of the heart you're looking at. And the amount of blood that it releases when it does its systolic motion is going to be called the stroke volume. The stroke volume in this example is 70 ml. And the amount that's left behind is going to be called our end systolic volume. That's going to be 60 ml. Because you started off with 130, you released 70 ml of that. So now you're left with 60 ml. Keep in mind that this is happening on both of the ventricles at the same time. And also what I want to point out to you is that your stroke volume, how much you release, is often going to correlate with your end diastolic volume, how much that you receive. If the heart receives more, it tends to give away more. If it receives less, it tends to hold on and give away a lower stroke volume than normal. So let me just make sure that when we look at this slide, we're able to explain end systolic volume, end diastolic volume, and stroke volume. End systolic volume is going to be how much blood is left in the ventricles at the end of a contraction. End diastolic volume is how much blood is left in the ventricles at the end of its relaxation period. And stroke volume is how much blood is given off when the ventricle contracts, i.e. how much blood will leave the ventricle and go into the blood vessels, either the pulmonary arteries or your aorta. You also have another term that's not really mentioned here. It's called the ejection fraction. The ejection fraction will calculate the ratio between the stroke volume and the end diastolic volume. So what is the percentage of blood that was given off? So in that case, it would be 70 over 130. And whatever percentage that gives, that would then be your ejection fraction. And this is the part where I need to actually get a calculator because I can't tell you on top of my head what fraction that would be. Isn't that shameful? So let's see, 70 over 130, that's going to give me a 53.8% ejection fraction. So I'm going to give away about 53% or 54% of the blood that was received. And you want to keep in mind that in a normal, healthy heart, Whatever happens on the left is happening on the right, and whatever blood they're receiving is what they're giving away, so the volumes will be the same, regardless of the fact that the left side of the heart is exposed to a much higher pressure point than the right side. Keep in mind that the reason that the pressure point is higher in the left is because the blood has to travel a longer distance. It has to travel throughout the entire body, so it needs to start off at a higher pressure point so the blood gushes out quicker and keeps a consistent flow. The right side of the heart will have a lower pressure point, and that's because the distance to the lungs is much shorter, but also because the alveoli tissue in the lungs um, is very delicate, so it's used to a low pressure point. But either way, whatever amount of blood is given off on the right is given off to the left. 
So if I say to you that your stroke volume is 70 ml, that means that the left is giving off 70 ml and the right is giving off 70 ml. And if we see that there is an imbalance, we can start going ahead and taking a look at some of the symptoms of congestive heart failure, which means that one of the ventricles is failing and is not releasing equal amounts of blood to its particular side of the body. It can be caused by many different things. Um, oftentimes we see that a patient might have suffered um, one or several myocardial infractions, heart attacks. They may have weakened the heart wall. Um, some patients, because of they have chronic high blood pressure, it can cause the pressure difference to be overwhelming to the system, so it can't balance stroke volume. Um, some people will have leaky valves um, or valves that will shut down or no longer properly close, leading for income complete blood flow. Um, so there are many different things that can cause this. But either way, um, you will notice that if the ventricle is insufficiently pumping on one side, it will affect the volume throughout the entire body. So let's go ahead and compare what happens if the left versus the right has any insufficiencies. All right, so let's take a look at the first one. It says, if you have failure in the left ventricle, that means that the blood is going to back up in the lungs, causing pulmonary edema. So the easiest way to think about this is since you have a two-sided pump, right side for the pulmonary, left side for the systemic, if one side shuts down, the blood is going to pull on the opposite end because the blood can't return to the defaulted part or the part that's not working. So if my left ventricle is not properly working, that means that the blood is gonna stay towards the right side of the body, which means it's gonna stay on the pulmonary side, which means it's gonna give me pulmonary edema. Edema just means collection of fluids. In this case, it's the blood fluid that's sitting there because it can't go to the left side this could be very dangerous because it can cause your patient not only shortness of breath, but some of them have actually described a sensation of suffocation, of drowning, because all of the fluid is sitting within the pulmonary tissue. If the right ventricle fails, then what we see happening is everything stays on the left side of the body. So now what we'll get is we're going to get systemic edema. The blood will just stay anywhere it can pull within the tissues. Because keep in mind that the left side that is properly pumping out the blood is basically flooding it into the entire system. But the blood can't return over to the pulmonary circulation. So the systemic edema will be generalized. It will be body-wise. So the patient will complain about swelling in their feet in their ankles, in their legs, um, the stomach area will enlarge, anywhere you can think of where the blood will start pooling together because it cannot return to the right side because of the right ventricular failure. So here's an illustration to kind of back up our previous conversation. So you can see right here, um, you will get pulmonary edema, so the fluid accumulating in the lungs, if there is failure to the left ventricle. And the reason for that is the right ventricle is still doing its job. It's still pumping out the blood into the lungs, but the blood has nowhere to go because the left side of the heart is malfunctioning. So the fluid will continue to accumulate in the pulmonary tissue. You will get systemic edema if we see that the right ventricle has failure. So in this case, we see once again, the left side of the heart will pump the blood over to the body. It will go ahead and do its systemic circulation. However, the fluid cannot return to the right side as it normally would because the right ventricle has failure. So therefore, the fluid will stay within the body, causing it all over its swelling, which is then your systemic edema. We also see that what we can do is once we know how fast the heart beats and how much it gives off at every beat, we can calculate what we call the cardiac output. The cardiac output is to figure out how hard 
does the heart work? So how much blood is it actually ejecting in every minute? And I want you to make a little notation for yourself. You'll see it on the slide right here. I want you to be able to tell me how exactly do we calculate cardiac output? And that formula is going to be heart rate times stroke volume. So the average heart rate is 0.8 seconds, right? It takes a heartbeat every 0.8 seconds. So in a 60 second period for a minute, you would have 75 beats per minute. And the average stroke volume, the average amount of blood that the ventricle allows to uh, gush out when it contracts, it's about 70 ml. So if you do your numbers in your calculator, your cardiac output would then be 75 times 70, that's going to give you 5,250 ml, which basically correlates to about 5.25 liters per minute of blood that's gushing towards the system. Now, obviously, the numbers are going to fluctuate a little bit. Um, so we could see right here on the PowerPoint, it says at rest, we're looking at about four to six liters of blood that passes through you every minute. Now, how much blood does the human body have? On average, four to six liters. So it's been estimated that every single red blood cell that you have in your body passes through the left ventricle at least once every minute. How cool is that? Because you circulate so much blood by doing the cardiac output, the heart rate times the stroke volume. Now you can alter these numbers, obviously, by altering either your heart rate um, or the stroke volume, the easiest one to manipulate is going to be your heart rate. And then we see, for instance, things like when you're exercising, we're going to notice that our heart rate will increase because it's responding to our sympathetic nervous system and it's releasing things like epinephrine and norepinephrine. And as the heart rate goes up, so does the cardiac output. So we have this thing called a cardiac reserve, which is basically what is the difference between your resting cardiac output and your maximum cardiac output. And usually what we see is that exercise is a great way to increase your cardiac reserve. And sometimes we see that if a patient starts to suffer from any type of cardiology-based diseases, like an imbalancement of the ventricles, um, or God forbid, a myocardial infraction, that's going to lower its cardiac reserve because the heart is not beating as efficiently as it normally would. You can also kind of feel the pressure that your blood vessels are exposed to every time your heart beats by calculating or looking for your pulse. So your pulse is basically when you kind of feel or palpitate a superficial artery, an artery that's close to the surface. So on the picture, I've shown you the radial pulse, which many of us can take right now. You can just select two fingers and put it right there by your wrist section, and you're gonna feel the pulsing of your arteries. That pulsing, tick, 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 that's the heart beating. And you can also do the carotid artery pulse, which is taking the fingers and inserting it on the side of the neck, and you'll feel your carotid artery pulsating, and that correlates with the heartbeat. On average, um, like I said, the number is 75, but obviously there's going to be a range. So here on the screen, I wrote for you that in adult female, it's usually 72 to 80 beats per minute. Young adult male is 64 to 72. Infants tend to have a very, heart, a very high heartbeat. If you've ever done a an, an sonogram with the baby, you'll notice that the heartbeat will tick, 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 extremely fast, up to 120 beats per minute. This all has to do with its very high metabolic rate, so it has an extremely high demand for oxygen and nutrients, so the heart will pump faster to make sure that these demands are being met as the infant is actively growing. As you become older, we also see that the heart rate will tend to increase, um, and that will partly have to do with the fact that the elderly will lose some of their elasticity in their blood vessels, and they might also have some arteriosclerosis, some hardening. So the heart will have to pump a little bit faster to kind of overcome these obstacles and still maintain adequate blood flow throughout the entire body. Now, tachycardia from a medical aspect is if you have a resting adult heart rate above 100 beats per minute. 
emphasis on resting. So you're not doing any activity, you're not doing anything vigorous, you're just kind of sitting on the couch, watching TV, relaxing. If your heart rate is consistently above 100 beats per minute, they're going to classify you with tachycardia. Um, they might prescribe you some beta blockers to kind of lower that heart rate, because obviously you don't want to put too much pressure or strain on the heart unnecessarily. Bradycardia is when you have a resting adult heart rate that's less than 60 beats per minute. And many of us go into bradycardia if we get a good night's rest. During sleep, our heart rate will lower because the demands on the body are less. And we also see that depending on your um, endurance rate or how well of a, a gym person you are, your resting heart rate could actually be lower because part of what we see is the more you work out the heart, the more you have a little bit of hypertrophy or enlargement that will occur primarily on the left ventricle, allowing the ventricle to release more blood with every stroke volume, thereby allowing the heart to lower its heart rate because the cardiac output will remain the same. So I remember reading an article once that said that at the peak of its performance, Lance Armstrong had a resting heart rate between 25 and 30 beats per minute. That's crazy, but the heart was able to uh, beat at such a low rate because his stroke volume was a lot higher because his ventricle was enlarged. And because you increase the stroke volume and you still wanna maintain the same cardiac output, of four to five liters per minute. If you increase the stroke volume, you can afford to lower the heart rate. Now, speaking of stroke volume, um, you can also manipulate this value, and there are three variables that will basically allow you to do this. These are going to be preload, contractility, and afterload. Now, preload basically takes a look at the amount of tension that the ventricle is exposed to before it contracts. And preload basically piggybacks off the fact that we were talking about whatever the heart receives or the ventricle receives, it will give back in its stroke volume. This is called the Frank Starling law of the heart. Frank Starling basically figured out that the stroke volume of the heart of the ventricle is proportionate to its end diastolic volume. So it will give away as much as it has received while it was in its relaxation phase. So if you have a high preload, you get a lot, you will give a lot back. You'll have a high stroke volume. If you have a low preload, then you will have a low stroke volume. So your preload is directly related to your stroke volume. If one goes down, so does the other. One goes up, so does the other. The other thing that's directly correlated to stroke volume is going to be contractility. Contractility is how hard will the myocardium of the ventricle actually contract. If you contract with full force, then your stroke volume is high. If you contract with less force, then your stroke volume is low. So on the bottom of your PowerPoint, I did write down that number one and number two, preload and contractility, are directly related to stroke volume. So if you increase one, you increase the other one. If you decrease one, you decrease the other one. So for instance, on your exam, I could say to you, what effect would an increase in contractility have on your stroke volume? And you would look for an answer choice that would say, it will also increase my stroke volume because whatever happens in the prelobe and the contractility will happen in the stroke volume. The third one is going to be inversely related, so it's going to be an opposite relationship. This one's going to be called afterload. Afterload takes a look at all the forces that oppose ejection. And if you have a high amount of afterload, you have a lot of forces that are preventing ejaculation of the blood. That means that you're going to have a low stroke volume. If you have a low afterload, so the forces are very limited, you will have a high stroke volume because the blood will have an easier time flooding into the pulmonary arteries and the aorta. Um, let's switch over to the next slide and let's take a, a more detailed look at this afterload concept. All right. So as I said to you before, afterload is the sum of all forces 
opposing ejection of blood from the ventricle. It's inversely related. And the largest part of afterload is blood pressure. All right, so the blood pressure that's happening in your aorta and in your pulmonary trunk to be more specific. If you have high blood pressure in these blood vessels, that means that the ventricle has to generate even higher pressure points for the semilunar valves to open up and blood to gush from high to low. So what we see happening, for instance, in patients who have hypertension, because the pressure in their aorta and their pulmonary trunk is so high, they have a very high afterload, the semilunar valves will have an opening that is very minimal. They'll only open for a few milliseconds, which means the ventricle can only get a minimum amount of blood out with every heartbeat. This is going to lower your stroke volume. So after load takes a look at the forces that oppose ejection, the most common ones will be the blood pressure in your aorta as well as in your pulmonary trunk. And by limiting the opening time of the semilunar valve because of the high pressure point, it will limit the stroke volume. So this is why you have an inversely relationship. If the afterload is high, stroke volume is low. If the afterload is low, stroke volume is high. All right, so this is our final slide for Chapter 19. And I've said it many times, but I just want to remind you, remember the discussion uh, sessions are open. I am available through email. I'm looking forward to your questions, your comments, and your concerns. I also want to remind you that for exam two, we are doing something a little bit different. Um, you will still be tested on two chapters, but the exam will be broken down into two parts. The first part will cover chapter 19, and that will be a traditional exam with multiple choice questions. You're going to log in on the day and time specified in your class schedule and you'll take your questions um, through Canvas. The other chapter, chapter 20, you're actually going to be completing a worksheet on Connect. And the reason for that is chapter 20 is all about labeling and naming the different arteries and veins. So it's best served through an illustrative aspect. So you'll be logging on to Connect. You can check your class schedule or my announcements for dates and availability. And you'll be logging on to Connect to do that part of the exam by labeling lots of blood vessels for chapter 20. And at the end of the day, what I'll do is I'll combine the score from the exam that covered chapter 19 and the activity that covered chapter 20. I will combine those scores to give you your overall exam two grade. Now, keep in mind, all this detail can be found in your revised syllabus, but you can also email me and I'll be more than happy to explain it. All right, so please peruse through chapter 19 and I will talk to you soon.